the proceedings of the next session. And may I invite on stage our distinguished session moderator, Mr. Ram Kondinya, Advisor Federation of Seed Industry of India. Let's put our hands together to welcome Mr. Ram Kondanya. Inviting our distinguished panelists, Dr. Tanushri Kaul, Group Leader, Nutritionals Improvement of Crop International Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology. A very warm welcome to you, ma'am. Joining us online is Dr. Makhan Singh Buller, Director, Extension, Punjab Agriculture University. I would also like to invite Mr. Omang Agarwal, Head Carbon Grow Indigo, and Mr. Srivastava Srinivasa Rao, Co-Founder and CEO, Trace X Technologies, is also joining us online. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to welcome you to the session that focuses on the role of policy and market dynamics in encouraging the adoption of DSR. We are joined by an eminent panel of experts. Two of them have joined us virtually. We also welcome them. And the experts have been instrumental in shaping the agriculture policy framework and understanding the market trends. Their insights will shed light on the path forward for DSR adoption. And our distinguished chairperson, Mr. Ram Kondinya, is an esteemed advisor to the Federation of Seed Industry of India, has a wealth of experience in the agriculture sector, particularly in the business of agriculture, with a corporate career spanning about 35 years at very senior positions. Mr. Kondanya is also known for his strategic management consulting and has served on the boards of various companies. He has been a vocal advocate for increased research investment in seeds and biotechnology, restoration of tax exemptions, GST input credit adjustments, and facilitated low interest loans for infrastructure development to support the seed industry and the farmers. And may I hand it over to you, sir, to kindly carry forward the proceedings of the session. And you have about approximately one hour, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. I hope we have your attention for this last session. Uh, I'm sure all of you are very heavy with a lot of knowledge since morning you have been absorbing. And I'm so happy that uh, there is so much of uh, information and knowledge which was brought into the discussions. And I'm also, uh, I also would like to say that um, the actual implementation of all these things will depend quite a lot on uh, the policy framework which actually supports uh, this entire concept. And uh, there are two key challenges. One is that it is a technology which calls for a change in the behavior of the farmer, change in his practices, which actually is a big challenge because farmers, very, it's uh, not easy for them to change their practices. So that's challenge number one. But challenge number two is also that we do have agriculture as a state subject when we talk of policy. And each state has got its own way of doing agriculture, right? And I am so happy that Abhi Hamare Kisan Bhai ne bataya ki UP mein bhoot achcha chal raha hai unka aur इतना अच्छा है कि आप घर में कभी मत बोलिए कि ये बीवी को गुस्सा आ सकता है अगर जो आप यहाँ बोले थे वो अगर घर में बोले तो तो I am so happy that UP government is supporting them but it's not the same everywhere so I think we need to also have some kind of discussion around how do we bring alignment between different states and you know many states offer free water free power, uh, which is actually counter to what we are discussing today. I think so there has to be some level of walk the, walk the talk by state governments. So how do we do that? And how do we bring a kind of a alignment between center and states? So these are some of the aspects on policy front we'll have to look at. And when there is water, so much water is being given free, what is the motivation for the farmer to actually go for DSR? So that is a big question mark. So how do we motivate the farmer? 
to actually adopt. And as I said, it involves change of behavior. So that is another thing that uh, I would like uh, that uh, we discuss today in this. And third is that um, this cannot be implemented or uh, scaled up without the enabling ecosystem. And what are the components of that ecosystem? Since morning there have been some discussions on that. How do we actually work on that? I think that is also uh, how does policy actually support some of the ecosystem development? And finally, the consumer. Consumer is nobody else. It is uh, all of us are consumers. So how do we as consumers uh, support uh, the rice which is produced uh, through the DSR method? And uh, how does the market reward a DSR producer? And how does the government reward a DSR producer? How do the government and the market differentiate between a uh, between rice produced through the TP method and rice produced through the DSR method. I think these are some of the questions on which we would like to discuss. Uh, there is a lot of discussion on uh, carbon credits. We have an expert on that also here. I would like to also understand that uh, through his uh, uh, comments, how can it be, how can carbon credit system be democratized in such a way that a small farmer sitting in a village in UP is able to access that and then is able to uncash uh, carbon credits. So what does the government have to do for that? Or what does the private sector have to do for that? How, do, how to build those platforms? Are there already some platforms which are helping in that? So I think those are a few things which we would like to discuss. We have a very uh, great panel today and uh, to start with I would request Dr. Tanishri Kaul, uh, who is a scientist and uh, she has some very interesting things to talk about uh, uh, how some of the improvements or some of the technological um, improvements they have done uh, in terms of the rice varieties which are meant for DSR cultivation. Good afternoon. I'm Tadunshri, and I work as a group leader at in International Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology. And my group focuses on crop improvement with special focus on nutrition. So I wish to switch the gears and uh, just sh give you a glimpse of what work we have done regarding uh, dry di direct seeded rice, which involves important uh, traits of herbicide resistance. Herbicide resistance as well as iron and zinc uh, enhancements in the plant as well as in the seed endosperm, which is an important trait for alleviation of micronutrient, my, micronutrient uh, my malnutrition as well as for uh, important trait in DDSR. So I would skip some slides because the introduction, the stage has already been set. And we, you know, the audience does not need any more explanations of why we are doing this. Uh, we already know that the um, uh, water guzzling puddled rice is leading to en enhancement in the global warming potential. And um, India is the second, um, the, the, the largest exporter of groundwater uh, in the form of rice and wheat. And most of the cities are out of uh, uh, groundwater. And this is the situation in Punjab, Haryana, and many other north northern states. So uh, in innovation in technology is through genome editing that we, that we work with. And uh, this is how the need of the art, dry DSR, utilizing this, uh, deploying this technology, we have tried to, in the last uh, um, decade and this decade, we've tried to develop and bring and stack these two traits into one rice uh, variety. That is Samba Masuri. So uh, as you all see in the slides, you see that weed rivalry and micronutrient deficiency are the important challenges to DDSR. So that is what we want to target. And we know that DSR does have a higher uh, weed uh, in incidence because um, there is a shift in the flora of the weeds. Those that were uh, uh, not adapted to puddled rice systems are now you know, uh, growing up because of the change. In, so there is a change in composition, there is change in diversity. Weedy rice, somebody said in the early, I forgot the names of the scientists, I'm sorry. So there is this weedy rice, which is just exactly like Oriza. 
this another uh, uh, genus of uh, a species of uh, rhiza, which is spontanea. So this is also, in, you know, gets mixed up with the rice uh, content, and it leads to, uh, uh, you know, difference in the milling uh, properties of rice. So uh, mechanical uh, weeding, manual weeding, is not, uh, you know, f feasible because you know that it is time time intensive, labor intensive, energy intensive. And we are losing a lot of uh, GDP because of this. So um, what we uh, focused on was introducing glyphosate resistance in rice. And we all know that glyphosate is the story we all know. But it is used currently uh, to, in weed control for 20 crops. And most of them, like 16 of them, are food crops. But in uh, most of the states, uh, two uh, you know, formulations are used, that is the 41% SL and the 71% SG. So this is how we wanted to introduce our uh, this important trait in uh, rice, Samba Masuri. These are the different states you see are growing uh, rice and are using glyphosate. As of now, there is no label for uh, glyphosate for rice. It is only used, allowed uh, for tea uh, trans uh, plantations and uh, non-crop areas. However, people are using, farmers you cannot stop, you see. As you see the Avinash, uh, the, the enthusiasm in them, so th they are using it. So using this uh, uh, technology of uh, CRISPR, we developed SDN2 uh, glyphosate resistant lights, rice lines. And you see that the EPA space enzyme was targeted. It's a sixth enzyme of the shikimate pathway. As, and the shikimate pathway, we all know as plant scientists, is in the chloroplasts. So it does not affect glyphosate does not affect human body. It only uh, it binds to EPSPS in the plants, and it uh, you know it acts as an analog of PEP, which is the original sub substrate of glyphosate. So this is how we try to introduce three mutations in this site through genome editing to make it uh, to make the rice more resistant to glyphosate. So as you know that in the field when you spray the herbicide. Uh, the weeds die, but our main crop is also affected because the fundamental principle is the same. Even the main plant has chloroplasts and has the EPSPS. So we need to protect our main crop, and hence we introduce these mutations. So this is the strategy how we did. We designed two guide RNAs flanking the conserved region, and we knocked out this region, and we introduced a donor, a homo donor, donor template and this had our desired mutations. And eventually, using the site-specific homologous recombination, I'm sorry I'm using these uh, terminologies, but being a scientist, I know <laughs> just this. So this is how it was done. So uh, we developed our indigenous vectors for CRISPR and for the monocots, as well as dicots separately. So we introduced these cassettes of Cas9, as well as these two guide RNAs to in introduce in these plants. We developed these lines. We checked them through PCR analysis, sequencing. Eventually, we now segregated the Cas9 gene because these plants would need to be, you know, uh, Cas9 free in order to be, you know, given an IBSC certificate to be uh, allowed to go for a field trial. So this is how we uh, segregated it. And uh, these are the sequence lines after segregation. The southern blots are showing that the Cas9 gene is not there in these lines. We sprayed them through foliar uh, Roundup uh, 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 spray of 41% glyphosate. And uh, when you see that after 28 to 30 days, we spray this. And within seven days, you see the first column after seven days of uh, spraying glyphosate. And the second column is after 14 days of spraying glyphosate. And the third column is the recovery within 45 days of this uh, plant. So the plant is almost uh, two months old. You see the, the right-hand side panel. Uh, <coughs> the, the control is not surviving. So the, 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 the slide shows the phenotypic analysis where you see the, uh, uh, the robust root system, which is going into the uh, soil. And uh, you see we got around 20 to 22 percent, 21 to 22 percent increase in yield. In these edited lines, the enzyme activity was uh, working well. The uh, initial substrate, which was shikimic acid, was utilized well in the edited lines. In, in, in comparison to treated control, you see it's not being utilized. Treated control is what happens in the field. When you're spraying the glyphosate, your control doesn't have mutations. 
the plant doesn't have mutation, so it would definitely be affected by glyphosate and the uh, uh, accumulation of shikimate will be there. Then uh, you see the aromatic amino acids, the end product of this pathway, also enhanced due to you know, uh, increase in the binding affinity that we created through mutations. In, and these are the lines that we uh, you know, suc uh, succumbed to, uh, the, the weeds succumbed to the uh, foliar sprays, but our edited lines survived. So this is another uh, you know, story of uh, developing iron and zinc enhanced rice, which is generally, you know, in, 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 in um, the rice which we eat is polished and milled, and it doesn't have any nutrient in the endosome. It, it is clearly starched, totally starched. So we try to, uh, for the f uh, first time, introduce three mutations and three important genes that are basically iron and zinc sensing genes that give a negative feedback to the roots to stop absorbing iron and zinc. Even in iron deficient st state, iron ab got absorbed. And this is what uh, this analysis, this is a first panel, you can see the iron uh, staining. You see in the center, it is dark. And this is not there in the control line. The first seed is a control. And then you see the others, you see the dark central part. So that is iron. And the second row panel is of zinc, and the third is of cadmium. So we have reduced cadmium, we have increased iron and zinc in the endosperm. And also the plants also uh, grew very well. They uh, be uh, became like a short or medium duration plant line. It, it, it behaved like a short or medium du duration plant line. There was early seed, uh, these are the panicles you can see. They are as good as a control, better than that. These are the seeds. We checked through ICPMS, so we had a different event, uh, 13 events or 18 events, out of which we screened around eight of them. This is the morpho-agronomic traits you control. With the blue line is the control one. The blue row, you see the edited lines are all performing better or as good as the control. So this is the Cas9 free lines that we, uh, you know, checked for uh, morphology. Now we stack these two traits into one, uh, and this is the field <coughs> experiment where we've uh, screening the best events, which has both H HT trait as well as the iron and zinc enhanced trait. So here you can see the late flowering that is there in the control plants in the first panel, and then the second panel, middle panel you see, and the third panel. The second and the third panel are the genome edited lines where you see early uh, 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 maturity in <coughs> early panicle formation, early seed setting, and early uh, uh, harvesting in that. So uh, my uh, only suggestion is that being a scientist where we are using this technology that is now actually been bought by Corteva from both the uh, warring partners, MIT and Berkeley, there must be some uh, way in which we can uh, you know, create, know the, t know the different uh, types of license because I, when I went last year to US, there was a, uh, there are three categories I was told by Corteva that there is a research license, there is a research and commercialization license, and there is a commercialized, purely commercialization license. So we, the government of India need to negotiate and see which, what are the terms, and eventually we need to come up to a certain, uh, uh, you know, consensus where we can go ahead with the field trials, because ACRIP means just screening in the field, but giving it to the farmers, we would need some kind of a, uh, and if it is like, uh, I was also told that if, if the farmers are like around 10, uh, the salary of the farmers is less than 10,000, we can, if we can give them freely, then Cortiva may not uh, uh, ask for any money. Uh, so maybe this is a solution, I don't know, but these are the thoughts that came to my mind. And this slide really uh, highlights all what people have said since morning, so I don't want to repeat the thing. And uh, this is the latest, uh, uh, you know, last month, uh, there was a subsidy given to Kharif farmers in Haryana that uh, they would be given for rupees 4,000 per acre incentive. And uh, this would be also, uh, there would also be a subsidy for DSR machines, so this I thought, would uh, be of some significance here. So, and also one more thing, the organic matter in the soil is degrading, so we need to take care of this because in the next 60 years it has been predicted that the soil would no more be there. So we just have 60 more years of uh, harvesting left. So until unless we do something by creating a policy which you know, retains organic matter up to 
three to five percent in the soil. We need to give that uh, incentive to the farmer to maintain this. Otherwise, uh, we won't leave a very good uh, earth or very happy earth for our children in the future. And one way of this is my lab is doing it through diversification of diets, introducing new novel plants into the mainstream. So thank you for this. Thank you, Ram. Thank you. This is my team. Thank you. I, I understood only the last three slides. Before that, I think uh, whatever she spoke in the technician, technical language, I will speak to Dr. Parikh afterwards and try to understand it. But uh, I think scientists would have understood it better that uh, there is, uh, what I understood is that the glyphosate tolerance we have developed along with the iron and zinc fortification uh, in the endosperm. I think that's a very good thing. And uh, we'll have to just discuss about how to bring it, this to the market, which you expressed in the last two slides, some of the difficulties. But of licensing and also how do you actually work with others because there are multiple people, IARI is working on something else and private industry is working on something else. How do we put all this together and then provide a comprehensive solution to the farmer? I think that is something which we can look at. We will talk uh, more about that later. So I think uh, it is also important that um, um, we have actually um, a kind of, uh, and there was a, disc the, she mentioned that also, that how do we motivate the farmers? How do we incentivize the farmers to actually adopt this? And I was just talking to the FAO representative in Delhi, uh, downstairs, he's in some other meeting. And I was talking to him that we are having this meeting here, he can come up and then uh, participate. Uh, he has visited fields in Punjab, Haryana, and then uh, he himself has got a project to you know, on DSR and uh, sustainable practices. And one of the things he said after visiting the fields is that DSR cannot be seen in isolation. DSR has to be a part of a package of end-to-end -end sustainable practices. That is where actually you will get the best results. So, you know, it has to start with zero tillage or minimum tillage and then um, the DSR then uh, the green manuring and then reducing uh, basal, uh, basal application of fertilizers and then again going for minimum tillage of wheat and then taking it to the end. So it's an end-to-end -end solution which we have to promote, which is not an easy task unless we are able to motivate the farmer to actually uh, practice it. And how do we motivate? I think that is something on which we would like to also have some discussion. We will see how Punjab is motivating the farmers. We have Dr. Buller here on the line, and he is the director extension of uh, Punjab uh, Agriculture Department. And so, Dr. Buller, welcome. So, uh, you could uh, please make your comments on how you are actually uh, promoting this uh, concept in uh, and what support government is giving to this in Punjab. Thank you, <coughs> thank you, sir. Am I audible, sir? Yes, yes. Please go ahead. Yes. Thank you, sir. Sir, uh, instead of Dr. Buller, uh, presently they are Director of Extension Education here in PAU. Uh, presently, due to ongoing Kisan Mela, uh, he is very busy. So I am from uh, his team. My name is Dr. Jasveer Singh Gill. I am working as agronomist. So my one of my specialization is DSR agronomy. So I uh, okay, sir. It, it please please go ahead. I, go ahead. Yes. Okay. Okay, ahead. sir. Okay. So uh, I am working as a rice agronomy specialist here in PAU Department of Agronomy, PAU Ludhiana. So in Punjab, sir, uh, DSR regained momentum uh, during the COVID era. So initially in 2009. The technology of dry DSR was given by Punjab Agricultural University, but uh, it never adoption, never uh, went uh, beyond one lakh hectare. So, uh, according to the feedback of the farmers and according to the ongoing studies, we remained refining that technology and 10 years after during 2019. So, Punjab Agricultural University brought another version of uh, dry DSR that is a Tattarvatta DSR. We know as uh, uh, 
initial speakers uh, quantified that Punjab, Haryana, and these uh, North Western states has different type of relevance in DSR. So during 2019, we refined the dry DSR technology. Although so many versions of DSR being practiced over pan India, at somewhere it is a wet DSR. And uh, because due to the availability of water, abundant water stagnation, farmers are broadcasting seed with different methods in case of wet DSR. But the conditions in our states in Delhi, NCR, Haryana, Punjab is different. Water woes are there which are much more important than other issues. Labor saving is also there. So many other benefits are there. Emissions are also less. Greenhouse gas emissions. But uh, uh, due to these issues, in dry DSR, uh, according to the feedback of the farmers and due to the several contrasting studies, it was reported that there was less water saving and at the same time more weed minance as earlier members also talking about their novel technologies about the management of the weed flora because when farmers, farmers are switching to DSR from, from puddled transplanted rice although there is more the density and as well as diversity of the weeds for which feed, for which farmers need more and more post-emergent herbicide to manage that crop and for the farmers, it is not only a water, it is a saving that they are driving, saving on cost of the transplanting and relaxation in the time of the sowing. Because under preservation of subsoil water act in Punjab, then it is enacted in Haryana also. It was mentioned um, the word transplantation. It, it here under this act, uh, no one or no farmer should plant, transplant its paddy crop before the 10th of the June. Now in DSR, such act is not there. So farmer has a benefit of the early establishment of the crop. So they make their crop, they make the DSR fit, they make the DSR to promote their multiple cropping system. They sow earlier, it matures earlier, and it is very good. Uh, uh, it became very good crop for intensive cropping system, specifically for those farmers, those are taking vegetable crops after harvesting of rice as a third, rice as a third crop. So due to the, uh, I'm coming back to that point, the um, problems or issues that we faced in dry DSR, we brought one new technology that is a Tarvatar DSR. Here, difference in that, this is not only a one technology, this is a set of technologies that make, that made one simple package on practice of direct seeding of rice, that is a technology of direct seeding of rice and, and named as Tarvatar DSR. Tarvatar means in contrary to existing recommendation or practice in which farmer used to so they are uh, rice crop in dry soil and powder like soil and start irrigating from zero day of sowing. For example, they sow their rice and they start starts irrigation. So what is then what is what was uh, ecologically why it is not why it, it is not good because when we are sowing direct seeded rice, we are uh, working in that period of the year when there is highest temperature prevails and highest evaporative demand of atmosphere prevails means that it is purely dry season. So when we start scheduling irrigation from zero day of sowing up to two, three, four weeks, we spent plenty of water that make it contrary and and uh, most of the time, so many people usually said it is it consumes same amount of water. But in Tarvata DSR, we as name as name indicates, our soil is Tarvata means sufficient soil moisture but workable. And there is one more sign of identification of that conditions of the soil is that that when your tractor tire lugs leave their imprint on the soil. So 
ਜਦ ਹਮ ਫਾਰਮਰ ਕੋ ਹਿੰਦੀ ਮੇ ਜਾਂ ਪੰਜਾਬੀ ਮੇ ਦੱਸਦੇ ਆ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਦੈਨ ਜਦੋਂ ਤੁਹਾਡੇ ਟਾਇਰਾਂ ਦੀਆਂ ਗੁੱਡੀਆਂ ਜਦ ਆਪਕੇ ਟਾਇਰੋਂ ਕੇ ਨਿਸ਼ਾਨ ਜ਼ਮੀਨ ਪਰ ਫੜੇ ਮਗਰ ਵਹਾਂ ਟਾਇਰ ਕੀ ਸਿੰਕਿੰਗ ਨਾ ਹੋ ਉਸ ਮੋਇਸਚਰ ਪਰ ਹਮ ਸੋਇੰਗ ਕਰਤੇ ਹੈ ਐਂਡ ਫਰਸਟ ਇਰੀਗੇਸ਼ਨ ਹਮ 21 ਡੇਸ ਪਰ ਸ਼ੈਡਿਊਲ ਕਰਤੇ ਹੈ ਔਰ 3 ਹਫਤੇ ਕੇ ਬਾਅਦ ਹਮ ਉਸਕੋ ਜਦ ਫਰਸਟ ਇਰੀਗੇਸ਼ਨ ਵੈਨ ਵੀ ਆਰ ਸ਼ੈਡਿਊਲਿੰਗ ਫਰਸਟ ਇਰੀਗੇਸ਼ਨ 3 ਵੀਕਸ ਆਫਟਰ ਸੋਇੰਗ ਸੋ ਵਾਟ ਹੈਪਨਸ ਇਟ ਡਜ਼ਨਟ ਸੇਵਸ ਓਨਲੀ ਵਾਟਰ ਬਟ it helps in remain keeping the pre applied pre emergence herbicides at the layer which act as the barrier for the emergence to, to the weeds but not only the crop because as earlier there was also discussion about the herbicides and other thing uh, i wish to uh, made it clear that pre emergence herbicide application is indispensable for the cultivation of dsr dsr crop although we are bringing so many uh, other resistant rice uh, varieties to the different herbicides good work done by the iri iri so in this regard pre emergence when we are going for tarvata dsr so irrigation saving is more as compared to puddle transplanting transplant rice that is up to the 25% that we noted in our research as well as the frontline demonstrations conducted at the farmers field so water saving is there and at the same time when we are not irrigating roots go deeper and deeper we are getting more root length more root, root biomass so when roots are exploiting more soil air going deeper then there is a lesser deficiency of micronutrient even nitrogen also so another thing is that weeds are significantly lesser in this practice so first of all at policy level i request that this technology for example it is only written dsr 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 everywhere for these days punjab haryana and delhi and here this tarvatar version should be promoted should be promoted for saving precious water next is that that its sowing should be commenced from 1st of the june because if the farmer plant dsr the sow dsr in the month of may there are more et losses more water consumption even one or two irrigations are more under tarvatar dsr technology but there is more water consumption through through these one or two uh, these uh, irrigations so next are the varieties so initially during the past there was not uh, any specific breeding program for dsr but now all institutions are doing good work and uh, giving very specific uh, dsr varieties initially varieties uh, bred for the cultivation of puddled transplanted rice same are being used in pau also we have a very now pr126 variety that is very much good for uh, cultivation of uh, rice through direct seeding so it has a initial growth so such varieties should be promoted and supported uh, and support should also give to the farmer presently our punjab state is giving rupees 1500 per acre to each and every farmer who is going for the dsr and at the same time our farmers most of the farmers has already been switched to the tarvatar dsr in this support that is being given by our state government that is 1500 there is not any upper limit if one is uh, sowing it on 100 of 100 acres then they are giving on 100 acres even there one is doing on 50 acres so this i think this sport is good but uh, although there is a very detailed uh, talk uh, about the uh, among sir about that uh, about the carbon so i personally wish that uh, the procedures should not be very much astringent for giving carbon credit benefit to the farmers it should be quite liberal and another thing i we observe that we experienced from our work uh, that is being done by uh, that is being conducted at the farmer field also that uh, there should be very much precise uh, estimation of the area under dsr through remote sensing it should be more precise and ground to ground truthing should also be available 
so input from my side is that another thing is that uh, there is one another one patented technology but it is uh, already commercialized that is very special machine that is named as lucky seed drill so this drill is not only this very much specific for dsr but it also so all other crops multi purpose drill machine that uh, so other crops in which there is need for the application of pre emergence herbicides along with sowing because when we are sowing dsr as i earlier earlier as i orated that we are working in harsh temperature high temperature and dry weather afterwards when there is a, initially when there were two operations farmer so their dsr crop there after he pick his another implements for the application of this spray so during by that time their uppermost soil layer becomes dry so due when it, the uppermost soil becomes dry the efficacy of applied pre emergence or preventive herbicide preventive herbicides get reduced because this is a that category of pre emergence herbicides that require sufficient soil moisture for their adoption with adsorption with soil particles and make a selective barrier so this i request kuldeep sir to play its video i wish to show the video that how this machine is promoting our dsr and specifically invented for dsr so i have sent the this video to kuldeep sir if is so uh, yeah kuldeep you are showing that how long is the video it's a 2 minute video okay sure sir sound is it playing sir yes it is playing it is not visible on my screen yeah no we all can see it so what is this machine called hello sir sir this machine named as lucky seed drill lucky seed drill okay okay yes sir so you can uh, see it is the uh, not only apply uh, the pre emergence herbicide with great precision it also recompresses the soil between two seed rows that ensures further uh, conservation of water because when we left the soil loose so it dries very quickly and it doesn't support the crop for first 3 weeks first 3 okay. weeks keeping crop dry without irrigation not only saves water but it is it is it proved as very good cultural method of weed control or good component in integrated weed management dsr okay. so another uh, input for the policy support uh, from uh, our side is that this machine should be promoted in the areas where there is a feasibility or where there we have to promote the tarvatar okay. dsr Okay. and another uh, that we we are getting good and fruitful result that uh, for 
better promotion or making this technology technologies better adoption so we should uh, maximum uh, demonstration good quality demonstration should be conducted and further not field day their travel seminar should seminars should be conducted to showcase that tarvatar ds technology to the agri technocrats farmers and other even some bureaucrats whatever who is whoever is interested so that crop should be shown to the established crop at two phases one is at establishment phase because initially when we say anybody that rice crop dsr crop doesn't need irrigation for 3 weeks they doesn't believe so that's why it should be shown to the to the masses and it should also be shown at shown at the maturity phase so uh, now okay. presently or conventionally uh, some training program or some camps by the departments of agriculture were started before the commencement of sowing season but if we show the standing crop to the farmers it uh, it Okay. fulfills the principles of seeing is believing okay thank sir, you sir this thank is totally you. from my side thank, thank you thank you thank so you dr gill i am here with you thank you sir thank you very much thank you so very useful and very uh, you know practical uh, suggestions and also what punjab government is doing and also he has got some suggestions on uh, uh, so important thing is carbon procedures should not be stringent and they should be actually easy for the farmer to adopt Uh, so i think that actually helps me to ask mr umang so to because you are dealing with carbon credits so maybe you can explain that how you foresee this entire carbon credit system becoming what support is required by the government and how this can become more democratized and how farmers can use it Uh, so thank you uh, let me first introduce uh, uh, grow indigo grow indigo is a 6 year 6 and a half year old company now uh, and and it's a regenerative agriculture first company right so our, we started as sustainable regenerative agriculture company uh, we launched biological portfolio of uh, products uh, particularly when we talk about dsr uh, you know some of our project uh, products are uh, seed coating bio fertilizer consortia is used to solve the germination problem that is very much prevalent when it comes to dsr uh, uh from bi from biological experience of of 3 years uh, in the last 3 years we have developed india's largest uh, and first high quality uh, carbon program uh, we have four programs listed which cover a total of 15 states and out of which in six states we are actively present as of today uh and rice of course is a major uh, focus crop uh in the last 3 years we have built a a very high powered quantitation engine you know how do you quantify the methane reductions from rice and that is where the whole challenge is uh how do you uh, make something that is totally backed by science and can stand the test of time ki 2030 mein bhi puchhenge ki ha aapne itna claim kiya tha 2020 mein so we can defend it uh, because we are moving with the latest Uh, we have built a team uh, and and tools that that can totally defend that that science uh, when it comes to adoption of uh, dsr uh, what i feel in the next 3 to 5 years what you know four levers that will really drive it uh, uh, one of course is policy uh, i think there is a lot of uh, you know policy directionally already there uh, when it comes to uh, what uh, dr gill said in terms of 1500 rupees dsr subsidy in punjab or 4000 rupees in haryana uh, 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 what what you know what i think will also help if it is more outcome uh, you know we we can leverage a lot of monitoring and reporting quantification technology of of the carbon program to to verify those uh, you know those acres that are being subsidized so i think that is where a lot of synergy lies uh, but policy is definitely the first uh, uh, lever uh, the second that i see is technology uh, when it comes to dsr you know there is no seed that is dsr first seed uh, in rice uh, maybe ht rice comes closest but i i think you know we have to get to making those dsr first uh, breeding those seeds uh, uh, and 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 of course in terms of equipment 
when you talk about seed drillers, ki how much depth, you know, I've, I've spoken to uh, farmers in Haryana and Punjab who uh, faced germination problems because the depth of uh, sowing of the planter was, uh, you know, it was more than what is required. So, uh, uh, you know, some innovation on the, on the planter side and Dr. Gill also presented, uh, you, you know, a lucky seed drill that, uh, that is a step in the right direction. The third I see is an additional carbon income, right? Now, if you see India's agriculture exports, basmati rice and non-basmati rice is $4 billion each. Uh, that's the largest, you know, an, any agri commodity gets. We see carbon as a cash crop uh, that could be India's largest agri export commodity uh, at about 5 to $7 billion of market uh, by 2030. Now, uh, this has to happen uh, with focus on integrity and quality because carbon, you know, it, it's, it's ultimately a data product and, and, and the quality and price that you get for that carbon credit is, is backed by the, uh, the data integrity and the veracity of that data that, that you can prove, that you can show with not just one but multiple layers of evidence uh, that, that we gather. Uh, finally, I, I see that the, uh, the fourth lever, uh, policy, technology, carbon, uh, carbon income and then finally the premium for the produce that, that farmer gets with, with forward market linkages. So as consumers, are we ready to pay for, uh, let's say in Delhi, a rice that comes from a system that does not uh, burn parali? And, and leads to fresher air, are we ready to pay a premium for it? All right, just, just, just if you see in, in, in coffee, the, uh, the analogy is that of fair trade, uh, wherein when coffee, co cocoa beans come from uh, a supply chain that do not use child labor, there is almost a 70%, 100% premium for it, uh, right? So are we ready to pay for rice that, uh, uh, you know, that, that cleans the air, right? Or, or rice that saves water? Uh, right? So these are very, very clear, tangible ecosystem benefits that, that DSR provides uh, that I don't think any other technology in crop, uh, crop side of things uh, provides. There are, there are more interventions in agriculture on the animal side, but we will stick to rice here. Uh, on the research side, uh, I think uh, what Dr. Tanushri mentioned on the uh, iron and zinc, uh, uh, you know, nutrient uh, uh, enhancement of rice, if you can couple it with the DSR uh, rice breeding, I think that's where uh, a lot of things will... Today we cannot di uh, discriminate between a DSR rice and a, uh, and a transplanted rice just based on a lab analysis of, of white rice uh, after milling. Uh, some technologies that can allow us to do that will also help you prove that it comes from a system that is... Uh, 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 and, 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 and I think, uh, sir, you'd mentioned in your opening comments that you would like to see a farmer, smallholder farmer in UP be able to enroll in the carbon program. So, so I, I would say that carbon program is like a sunrise. It, it happens slowly first and then suddenly. So uh, we are there. We've built this uh, platform in the last three years. And now uh, we are aggressively scaling up. Our program is an assisted, vertically integrated model right now. It is not a self-service model for a reason. Uh, we want agricultural carbon credits uh, in India to be a brand, right? And, and that is where you are able to uh, get a premium for it. Uh, you might be aware, a decade back, carbon market had crashed and India was infamous for producing a lot of uh, spurious credits, uh, right? Uh, from from, uh, uh, from non-agriculture sectors, right? So renewable energy and all that. Uh, we don't want that to happen with agricultural carbon credit, right? Manojji uh, in the last session mentioned about uh, a $40 per credit uh, price. You are able to get that only when you have quality, you have veracity, you have no double counting, you have a proper quantification which is backed by science. And I think that is where we should, uh, uh, some of the policy can also focus on how do you make Indian agricultural carbon market as, as a brand in the world, right? It has a lot of co-benefits beyond climate of carbon and, you know, methane reduction and water. Carbon credits in the global market uh, should be definitely uh, one of the objectives with which we should work. So that can happen only if we produce uh, carbon credits of high integrity and uh, consistent quality. I think those are very important. But that also has to be intrinsically linked with the branding of DSR rice. Unless DSR rice is branded and we buy it paying a bit of a premium, uh, the farmer will not be incentivized. So how can that happen? <clears throat> how DSR rice can be traced from the field 
to the dining table. So is there some technology that can help us, traceability technology? We have TraceX here uh, online. We have uh, Mr. Srivatsa, Srinivas Rao. So <coughs> you have something to share with us that how this can be traced from the field to the dining tables? We will be very yes, interested right. to listen to that. Sure. Uh, I hope you all can hear me well. Yes, yes. Yeah, thank you. Firstly, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity. And uh, yeah, quite a pertinent topic on which uh, we have we've been doing a good amount of work for the last uh, four years now. Um, so definitely while uh, DSR has multiple benefits as all the speakers spoke about, uh, including, um, uh, you know, the sustainability, the quality of the rice and, and so on and so forth. I think eventually, unless uh, uh, it is produced in a way that farmers eventually benefit from it, I think uh, somewhere down the line, we would have lost the uh, uh, primary um, uh, pri primary objective of of, uh, of these technologies, right? So, again, uh, when 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 we have to talk about uh, um, popular, a very transparent uh, uh, supply chain can be showcased to the market uh, to meet uh, its its demands. Uh, in my opinion, uh, when we have to prove better uh, market linkages or better benefits to the farmers. Um, I think it would have to go all the way back to uh, the seed where it be belongs to, right? So, uh, right from uh, uh, sourcing the uh, or establishing the quality control for the source seeds that are being used uh, in production of the high quality rice is something that needs to be established. So, we need to maintain uh, um, uh, 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 you know, a record of information that uh, essentially uh, contributes to the traceability of the source seed itself. That is the one place where technologies like us can uh, 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 play a very significant role. Just to give you a 30 seconds uh, pitch on what we do uh, at TraceX, we are building a digital agriculture platform that will help uh, establish farm to fork traceability, leveraging technologies like blockchain. Uh, that's what we do. Uh, yeah, we, we uh, can build uh, technologies like us can build traceability right from the source uh, seeds from where the, uh, who are the from where the seeds are being sourced to where it was grown how it was grown what are the uh, what is the genetic purity of the seeds that has been uh, grown the varieties uh, depending on the varieties and what seed treatment was done and so on and so forth needs to be established to uh, essentially guarantee the quality of the, and authenticity and genetic purity of the uh, uh, seeds it's, itself so that the uh, uh, it is not just about uh, taking this to, uh, to the consumers and showing the traceability it is also more most importantly about ensuring optimal yields can be expected by the uh, uh, farmers uh, uh, on the crops Right. And secondly, um, because DSR is a specialized way of production of uh, uh, rights, uh, and, and as we discussed, uh, it is essentially delivering uh, multiple benefits. I think it's also very important to uh, track um, and record all the uh, activities, farm practices that happen on the farm itself, right? Right from uh, the time growing season starts to various uh, uh, activities that are carried out, uh, which are package of practices that are carried out in uh, alignment with the um, agronomy uh, practices that must be followed that is recommended to the farmer. So I think that it's very important to be able to uh, track that and bring about the regenerative agriculture practices that are implemented in production of uh, the rice itself, including it could be right from land preparation to uh, sowing to uh, irrigation, for example, if uh, along with DSR, if uh, AWD uh, um, method of water management practices are followed, which is essentially reducing the uh, GHG emissions in the paddy field, these must be uh, documented well and made uh, easily, uh, convincingly available to consumers of these products so that uh, the, the folks that are uh, uh, buying uh, the, the, these products, they buy not just for quality, they also buy it for a purpose uh, that has gone behind uh, the production of the of the seeds itself. Uh, that's one area where a comprehensive uh, information about the entire cultivation processes can be tracked on solutions like us uh, to ensure transparency in the en entire production uh, uh, practice itself. Right, um, which again uh, ties with uh, uh, how the environment impact uh, is, is is done. Right, so as some of the speakers were talking about. Uh, 
if someone were to uh, uh, claim the environmental benefits of uh, of 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 DSR method, it needs to be documented. It needs to be brought out, uh, right? It needs to be uh, uh, shown out there on what is the environmental footprint or the carbon footprint of the or the uh, GHG emissions itself that is associated with the production of the um, uh, of, of the rice itself, which which is something that can be uh, very clearly established uh, on 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 platform like us. While that is all. If we look at uh, the pre-harvest side or the production side, there is a whole lot of things that also happen on the post-harvest side uh, where uh, there is a, a transformation of uh, a paddy that uh, eventually results in, in uh, rice, right? For example, right from procuring uh, the paddy to uh, estimating the yields to the storage condition, the transportation conditions to uh, a transformation of uh, paddy into rice, uh, uh, how the supply chain were all connected and, and how the... Uh, uh, integrity of the data is maintained across the supply chain is something that uh, will be very helpful in establishing a clear farm to fork or farm to table as we call uh, traceability so that the quality uh, of, of the produce can be demonstrated eventually leading to it could be either through certification uh, a formal certification of uh, uh, schemes or it could be even uh, uh, labeling through responsible labeling it, it, it can be ethical sourcing or uh, truthfully uh, produced uh, uh, authentic product and so on and so forth but that backed with data i think eventually will make it more lucrative for uh, farmers to get better uh, uh, you know premium from the uh, from the market uh, that's one and and finally obviously all of this culminates into uh, better engagement of uh, uh, consumers with better transparency so when when uh, the story is told more convincingly to the consumers they uh, more than, more often than not uh, they will be uh, uh, happy to be uh, uh, buying uh, for a purpose that contributes to larger impact uh, co-beneficial uh, impacts it is not just about farmer it is environment farmer uh, uh, and so on and so forth i think i think that's where uh, systems uh, can be can contribute to bringing in uh, greater transparency traceability and showcasing sustainability of the supply chains but that's where i will uh, sort of pause uh, uh, happy to take any questions but i think th those are uh, that's where digital technologies can be uh, very helpful in um, uh, in enhancing the accountability transparency and sustainability okay. through the supply chain uh, thank you for everything. thank you very much I think uh, that process you have explained is a very robust process and as you said, uh, it is based on blockchain uh, so that the integrity is maintained. Uh, yeah. That can actually give confidence that we can brand the rice as DSR produced rice and yeah. the consumer can scan a, a code on the yeah. pack and then understand the complete traceability of the product from the seed stage. <clears throat> that is the level which, uh, to which we should reach in the next few years time. And um, I think so that's very good. So now I come to in the pause because of time constraint, um, we still have Mr. Raghavan who will speak about what we said that uh, enablers are very important for this to happen. And enablers are related to multiple industries, whether it is the seed industry or the CP industry or fertilizer industry or farm machinery industry, all of them have some requests to the government right, uh, on yes. policy support that is required. So I would like you to highlight um, uh, in five minutes, if possible, that yes. what are the policy uh, imperatives for each of those sectors? Sure, it's already a long day. Uh, and do have a long list, but uh, I focus on first the seed industry, because that's the foundation of whatever we do. Uh, the seed industry definitely needs to uh, invest in developing specific varieties and, and hybrids uh, whatsoever. Uh, for that, there is already a lot of uh, work happening, but we just need some kind of oiling or support. Say, to, to, to say as an example, restoring the 200% weighted income tax benefit will not only benefit uh, the, the companies that are working on rice, but in the seed sector as a whole. And as well as there are lots of other uh, uh, enablers. For example, if we have a strong IP protection environment, that will also protect the investment of the people, which will, I mean, without knowing that my, my investment is protected, I cannot put money. That's as simple as that. So we need a strong intellectual property protection environment. At the same time, I at least I heard in this room from one of my colleagues that a private sector participant said, public sector is doing so much in DCI. And another comment came from a public sector participant that private sector is active. 
So this is what we need to do actually in terms of bringing them together and fostering collaboration. And this is actually, this event is actually a first step in that direction. Uh, so I mentioned uh, specific developments uh, uh, of varieties, IP protection, public partnership, and everything will come down to ease of doing research and ease of doing business. Streamlining the uh, commercialization and licensing uh, issues in, in uh, seed business is definitely going to be a game changer. Now I shift gear to the uh, crop protection sector. We talked about weed management, how important it is. We need to have technologies not only uh, in the genetic modification side, but as well as uh, the, the, uh, the other technologies such as gene editing. Uh, we need to promote integrate pest, integrated pest management in a wider scale. That doesn't, uh, that doesn't mean that we have to go in, in a way that our neighboring country went. We need to be more pragmatic about it. And we need to enhance uh, monitoring and uh, uh, pest and disease monitoring mechanism throughout our country. So that's from the crop protection sector. The machinery sector definitely needs support in terms of uh, custom hiring centers, supporting uh, uh, establishment of smaller uh, uh, centers where farmers can get equipments at a, at a fair cost. Research on DSR specific machinery is something that's definitely the need of the hour. That's from the uh, machinery sector. Finally, the, the crop nutrition sector we need to do a lot to promote balanced fertilizer application, balanced fertilizer um, uh, through soil testing, which needs to be done at a wider scale. So these are some of the points that came from uh, the, the ecosystem, which, uh, which, which, which together will enable that CSR becomes the uh, way to produce rice, ultimately because we are exporting rice, but in, in, in essence, we are actually exporting water. So uh, these are the points from uh, the policy angle from different uh, ecosystem players and the value chain. And of course, I mentioned one, I missed mentioning one point. To make all these things happen, our uh, Kisan friend uh, explained nicely that there should be a promotion uh, of uh, a crop, even crop specific FPOs. At the same time, there should be enablement in terms of access to finance for the FPOs and the farmers so that they will be able to uh, carry out this uh, particular or any way, any other uh, technology with, um, um, uh, with profitable, uh, in a profitable manner. Uh, that's what, uh, uh, that, Thank that, you. Those, are the, those are the points from my side. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. I think the ecosystem, um, a lot of points came since morning that we need uh, we need uh, the right type of crop protection chemicals. We need the, I think Dr. Singh, I think mentioned that we need the right seed treatment and seed coating to be used uh, to protect the seed at the initial stages in the soil. So we need those products. We need uh, uh, crop nutrition which, ha which minimizes basal application of chemical fertilizers so that you are able to protect the soil. I think the soil organic matter uh, also came up in the morning and even Dr. Tanushri mentioned about it. Soil organic matter is a huge area of concern. And this is also something on which we need uh, some kind of a mechanism to encourage farmers to use green manure and things like that. Mechanization, uh, I think uh, Ravi um, of uh, Kisan Craft also mentioned about this, that mechanization uh, even for DSR is very important and then how do you actually um, you see, uh, running a, um, a custom hiring center is a very capital intensive business for anybody. And uh, each machine has a limited uh, turnaround time uh, in the season because seasons are very short. So the capacity utilization of machines is low. So the entrepreneur who is actually running them doesn't make any money. So there has to be a mechanism by which the custom hiring centers are made uh, profitable, but also banks are ready to fund them and the numbers must really scale up. Otherwise, whether it is HTPS cotton or whether it is DSR rice or even other mechanization programs that are going on, they will not scale up unless we find a way of uh, funding the uh, custom hiring centers. So I think that is a very important point which also came out. But mechanization is a very important aspect of both DSR 
and HTPS, DSR rice and uh, HTPS cotton. Uh, we also said that there should be a suitability uh, mapping of DSR methods. There are so many variations, I think 13 different methods were talked about. So how do we, so what also comes down to is, uh, and this came out in many of the uh, presentations in this session, that farmer education is of the highest priority in this. If the farmer is not educated properly on how to do DSR, uh, he won't be able to understand all the nuances. So I think a lot of these things came out that we need a very strong um, advisory and extension support for the farmer to shift to DSR. And as we said in the beginning, uh, changing farmer practices is not easy. He will be very conservative, he will be risk averse, so he will not be able to shift so easily. So this incentivization of 1500 rupees what Punjab is giving, I would consider it as a uh, as a starting point. But I think even if the incentivization is uh, much higher than that, it is worth it to look at this because I think this is something on which the future rice production can be transformed. So we must look at even higher levels of incentivization. Uh, initial investments, this point also came up in the morning that there is a need for credit from banks to the farmer to actually do the initial investments into switching to DSR, whether it is uh, for buying uh, equipments or uh, machinery and things like that. And we also said that uh, we must, I think this is one of the things uh, we talked about that um, the carbon credits thing has to be brought to the doorstep of the farmers. Of course, uh, Omang said that it, cannot, it, is not a, it is not something, it's not a self-service model which will come up. It will have an assisted model, doesn't matter, but even in an assisted model, we can work through FPOs or we can work through other grassroots level organizations who can actually help farmers to enroll themselves onto the carbon credit platforms and use them uh, also to sell the carbon credits and make money at the end of the day. So I think this is something, you know, India, whatever India does, if it does successfully, it will dominate the world because of the sheer numbers. You know, the, just imagine the amount of carbon credits we can produce from India if we really create that level of awareness and facilitate the farmers to do it. So the, I think carbon credits is another area where government has to step in and then see that whether such platforms are developed by government or uh, government helps such uh, platforms to come up. I think that is also something we need to look at. And as I said earlier, end-to-end -end sustainable practices are very important. DSR in isolation cannot help. So we also need to promote things like minimum tillage and uh, other sustainable practices. Um, so new variety development and IP protection, I think these things have come out very well. Weed management uh, solutions have to be uh, fast-tracked for approval process, regulatory approvals if it is necessary. I see today that there are many non-GM options in that, so which is actually a good news. I think that should help all of us to fast-track them and bring them to the market much faster. Uh, DSR specific machinery development and DSR specific varietal development, these are also very important things which have come out. Now these are all requirements, I mean we can say that these are all required but then uh, what is the role of policy in making sure that these all come together? I think that's where actually we need to spend some time that with the government that these are the things which need government support. Some of them may need pure financial support, some of them may need extension support, some of them may need uh, just a collaboration support, like between uh, public and private, it is more of collaboration and working together. So I think uh, a lot of these things have come out today in this discussion and um, we are able to actually um, say that uh, the policy at the end of the day, as I said at the beginning, at the end of the day, I will also say that in the end, that at the end of the day it is center and state which have to, come, which have to work together. This cannot be done by either center or by a state. And it has to be a well-aligned policy. And uh, flood irrigation uh, must stop, full stop. There's nothing else. Flood irrigation must stop. That means micro-irrigation has to take over. That means uh, all the water subsidies and power subsidies must go. And there is really no doubt about that. Otherwise, why should the farmer switch to DSR to save water when he's not paying for water? I think it's a very simple equation. So the right hand of the government should know what the left hand is doing. So they must work together and then provide comprehensive 
policy coverage for this. Thank you very much. Thanks to the panelists for really bringing out all these points very effectively. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. So ladies Thank and gentlemen, we would like to convey our gratitude to all our esteemed guests, distinguished delegates, and all the participants who have contributed to the rich tapestry of the discussions in this conference. The knowledge exchange here has not only been thought-provoking, but also instrumental in charting the course of future action. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to extend our deepest gratitude to all the speakers, panelists, and moderators who have graced us with their expertise and wisdom. We also convey our gratitude to all our participants for your valuable participation in making this conference a huge success. Thank you once again, and please join me in applauding the efforts of the organizing committee, as I also thank all our eminent panelists. And sir, please, a group photograph before we come down.